So welcome to the second of five Communitas lectures that we'll be hosting this semester. I'm Laura Gelfand, head of the Department of Art and Design, and I'm pleased to recognize those who have made Kijong Jian's visit and this exciting series possible. The Communitas series features artists, designers, and scholars whose lives and work promote the values of equality, diversity, and togetherness. The series has been funded by the Marie Eccles Kane Foundation, Russell Family, the Department of Art and Design, and the differential tuition contributed by every student who enrolls in classes in the Kane College of the Arts. This year-long series is the department's signature event for USU's Year of the Arts celebration. And with that, I would like to welcome Professor um, Associate Professor of Interior Design, Darren Brooks, to introduce, introduce tonight's speaker. I am super excited for this series. Um, I'm super excited that you're here. I was fortunate to work with Catherine and Manon when we designed the performance hall and I did the interior design. And they would be thrilled and over the moon that this series is happening. I'm also really excited because Kijan is one of my very good friends and um, we've known each other for a number of years and it's for me a real honor to introduce him and for him to come to Utah State. I've been excited about this for a long time. It seems like these things just happen, but it takes a couple of years of planning in advance. In fact, I got an email from one of the visiting artists that I have contacted, and they said, are, are you sure we're really coming that far out into the future? I said, yes, we really do plan ahead. Um, Kijan Jian is a professor uh, and inter of interior architecture program co and coordinator in art and art history in the Department of California State University, Chico. Prior to joining CSO Chico, he spent 10 years working in the San Francisco Bay Area as an environmental designer and branding environments for major US corporations. He's received numerous awards, um, including Critiques Magazine Annual Design Award in Environmental Design. Recently, he received the in International Interior Design Association it's first inaugural diversity award. And I wanted just to spend, just a, just talk a little bit about that because for me, this is really, really cool. Um, when we were in uh, Chicago this last March, Kijan received his award. And it says the International Interior Design Association, I IDA, which I'm a member of, um, Foundation and the Interior Design Educators Council have named Kijan Jean as the recipient of the inaugural IIDA Diversity Award. This award recognizes a professor and interior architecture coordinator for his significant contribution to interior design education, as well as his representation effort of a diverse background. He will receive $5,000 from the foundation and will be recognized in Chicago. Cheryl Hurst of IIDA said, she's executive vice president and CEO, she said not only does Kijan encourage his students to demonstrate social responsibility through design, he is making his own mark in designing for people living with autism and other developmental disabilities. In addition to teaching, he's dedicated his career to designing build environments for the autistic and for others with special needs or, or developmental disabil disabilities, serving as a principal of his uh, environmental design firm with, for special needs. His recent work includes Redwood Residence in Palisades, California, the SOAR, a center for clients with severe developmental disorders, and um, I'm gonna let you explain the others because they are a little too difficult for me to pronounce. Uh, as we teach uh, students to design, we are simply bringing more designers into the industry, he said. However, if we just teach our students design as a means of healing, we are developing well-rounded designers that progress our industry by 
embracing diversity. One of the cool things for me personally is seven years ago, I came out as gay and I went to the assistant provost and I said, do you know of another professor on campus who is gay? And she said, there is one that I know of and I had coffee with him two days later and I ended up marrying him. And one of the cool things that impressed the jurors of this competition is that Kijan is also an out professor on his campus and students are comfortable and feel confident that when they come and speak with him that he's open and receptive to all students. And so this diversity award, I think it was such a tribute to him and to the work of his students. And it's always the impact of what students have to say about professors are the ones that, that, that a jury listens to. They wanna know how someone impacts uh, their student learning. Uh, he received his master's degree from the University of Oregon and a Bachelor of Fine Arts of Interior Architecture from California College of Fine Arts. So it's with great pleasure that I present to you Professor Kijan Jean. Um, I don't know, I'm very nervous right now. <laughs> Uh, especially the, the Professor Brooks make me more nervous because he sounds like uh, I'm a great person, but, <laughs> but I'm not sure. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, this is a very special moment for me, so do you mind that I take a picture of you? <laughs> so I can post it in my Instagram? You know, because I, I always like uh, take a picture some special moments. And like uh, when I go to the very fancy restaurant, I want to take a picture of my food too, so, <laughs> you know. Okay. Uh, my name is Aki Jong Jun. Um, um, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to uh, Utah State campus. Um, I feel very, very honored to be here. So sometimes when I come in here, especially in front of you, I feel like I, I don't know whether I deserve to be here, so, but I'll do my best. Um, how many of you are, you know, what level are you, most of this, you guys, students? Like freshmen? Okay. Okay, most of you are art and design majors, I guess? Okay. How many of you do you know what is the autism is? Okay, um, do you have anyone who has a family member or a friend or some relatives are in autistic? Wow, okay. So probably a lot, a lot of you already know about the, what the autism is then. Okay, which helps me a lot because I like to know the, how much uh, the audience understand what the autism is. So that helps me a lot about how much that I can talk with you about it. So, um, Oftentimes I got uh, these questions, what make you decide to work in a, a projects related to the autism? Very common questions always. I have no idea what autism was. Until 10 years ago, almost exactly around this time, uh, 10 years ago, uh, I got a phone call from somebody to my office. And he's, usually I don't answer the phone. I let the voicemail take it, so that way, most of my phone call is about complaint from the parents. So I let the voicemail take it, then I listen later, then I prepare for my answers. But that day, I answered it. And, um, and he said that he's the director of the, one of the um, facilities, you know, and uh, he says uh, he needs some of my help. He says, I says, how can I help you? And he says, I need some interior design help. I said, okay. So what aspects of interior design do you need from me? So, uh, if, if that is possible, would you please select a carpet for our facilities? Anything else? That's it. So that is a very common 
public's perception about uh, what interior design you know, is. Probably still does that. So, which is perfectly fine. You know, selecting carpet is a big part of the interior design, of course. I have no problem for that. But, as you may know, selecting a carpet for any space, we cannot just select the carpet based on the color, or my favorite colors. So, we need to find out what is the function of the space? Who used this? What do they do? And several different questions. So I asked them what this space is for. First answer was, this is a, a center for the uh, people with the autism. At the time, I never heard about the autism. So what I did is I put my phone in the back here. I Googled it. I very scanned it very quickly what the autism is. Then I noticed that it's a very serious uh, social aspects at the time. So, and um, I decided to, I'm gonna meet with him a few days later. Until I meet him, I did a little research about that, autism. So one thing that I found out was, um, I found out um, a lot of the symptoms about uh, uh, people with autism has a very s sensitive to sensory aspects, which is uh, sound, uh, visions, and smell, or tactile. It's a lot of, all those kind of a sensory aspects is uh, related to the uh, environment. So if there is an environment, I feel like I can do something for them someone who studies, teaches, and research about the environment. But I don't know what, but I feel like I can do something. At least I can make the, they can have a better life. So when I meet him at about three days later, I did a little research about that one. Even I was more shocked, um, especially uh, how fast the uh, autism is growing here. Now, actually, I did research about that CDC records about uh, a few months ago. And that is uh, now is about uh, one out of the every 68 students in, in America is uh, autistic. When I was doing it 10 years ago, it was like uh, 250. But last 10 years, that number has been changed this dramatically. So I told him, how busy this project is. And he says, oh, we're not that busy, even we don't have the money yet. Okay, that means I have a lot of time. So I told him, can I have a six months? I feel like I may do something for your facilities. And he said, okay, that's good. So I started doing some um, research about uh, more of the what is the autism is. Um, I prepare some of the what is autism is, but I'm gonna skip this part a little fast, since like uh, most of you understand what autism is, okay? So is that okay with you? Yes? Okay. So uh, maybe I can very quickly, and uh, there is a certain social uh, behavioral issues, and especially the, some of the communication behavioral issues as well. Uh, because usually they have uh, some language issues there, and a communication, interacting with the people. And a lot of them has a, a behavioral difficulties. Um, they have a difficult time to communicating, you know, especially in a certain long period of time. And especially they have uh, difficulties with and, uh, uh, other peers. And especially one of the uh, sensory aspects here you know, which this is the kind of important part of my lectures, especially the sound, they are very sensitive to noise, especially the humming sound, especially sometimes air conditioner sound, sometimes, um, what is that? Um, even the, some of the uh, fluorescent light that are humming sound, that drives them crazy. In a light, they are very uh, sensitive to the light, uh, especially the fluorescent light, and as a lot of times when autistic person, when they go to um, 
the Walmart or Winkles. I saw the sign of the Winkles on right here. If you go to Winkles, there's a full of uh, fluorescent light. I don't know whether you may not be there yet. And the way the fluorescent light is working here is a two end, which is an arc, is create a little arc. Um, so then that arc touches the phosphor, which is the white part of the fluorescent light, then phosphor generates the light. The frequency of this arc very fast, so most of us cannot see the arc. But a lot of the autistic person, they can see the light. So they feel like they are in a, a lightning. So that's a very scary, even they have a very frustrated, even they are screaming a lot at their, you know, the, the fluorescent light environments. So that's what, that's, they are that much about the scared by those, uh, the lights. And often they are sensitive to smell, um, especially the certain odors. And also they are, um, some people likes the uh, touching, some people do not like to touch. Especially they are scared about the someone coming and hugging them. And the taste, you know, they are uh, very sensitive to certain tastes, especially some um, hot and spicy taste. So it's, they are very difficult. It's, if you, can you imagine we have uh, five different senses, any of the senses bothers you and uh, scares you, your daily life would be so miserable, don't you think? And there's a two different type of the uh, autistic uh, uh, client. I'm gonna use the word for the client. I learned from the, the people at the Cove um, because we don't use the word patient. Patients means someone who is sick. We don't consider them as a sick. They are different than us, simply. They have a different senses. So instead of using the, uh, the patient, usually I like to use the word for the client, which means client, somebody who uses the space that I designed, okay? So there's a two different type of the clients in you know, artistic clients. One is a hyposensitive, one is hypersensitive. One is the, uh, the hyposensitive is that someone react very slowly or less based on to certain uh, um, sensory aspects. And the other part of the hypersensitive uh, client, they're extremely sensitive to a lot of the sti stimulations, which means it, makes it very difficult for us to design for this artistic client because it's not like a one size fit everybody. So with exactly the same design, certain type of the clients, they love it, certain type of the clients, they cannot stand. So that is one of the very difficult part of designing uh, environment for autism. Okay. During six months, um, I did a lot of observations, especially I went to some uh, uh, schools, and especially some of the uh, some uh, schools with uh, uh, behavioral challenging um, the kids, and I got some permission. I sit in the back, or sometimes through the window, I did have some observations. And when um, the teacher gave them a piece of paper to draw, and then I noticed that actually that I teacher told me who is the autistic students. So I kind of know the number of the who is that, so I can compare their behavior, how they are different than other uh, autistic, uh, other students. So that is a, became a good comparison for me. So one thing, I very first day when I went there, one of the schools, the teacher gave a little piece of paper to draw, and instead of they are drawing it, they shredding the piece of paper, eight and a by 11 size paper. And then they shake this, the piece of paper in their eyes. That was very new to me. So I came home, I did exactly the same thing what I shredded the paper, the way they are shredding, I shake my eyes, see what are they getting out of it? So I did a lot of activities. One of the, just, uh, our staff person, 
and her son is autistic, and I got a lot of information from her, and she says uh, her son likes to be laid down in the behind of the sofa, and she, he likes to, his uh, brother, go on, on top of him and step on him with a kind of a pillows on top. I wasn't sure what, what, why they like this. So I came home, I asked my son to put a pillow on it, step on me, but he's big, so be careful, be slow. So I trying to experience the way they are trying, what are they getting out of this? So I'm trying to connecting their emotional aspects of how they feel about through the certain activities. I'm trying to integrate that feeling into the designing of the environment. So one of the important part of that, my design was the steaming here. That is called the steaming. And some clients, they use the, uh, the comb, you know, the hair brushing combs, and they, they're shaking their eyes too. So they basically, uh, the steaming is a self-stimulation behaviors. Basically, they are stimulating themselves with uh, some paper or combs and things like that. So that is a part of the repetitive, the physical movement or sound and it's a movement of the certain objects they like to watch, okay? Uh, probably the steam is a, one of the, the most common um, uh, behavior for uh, people with autism here. And oftentimes they are rocking and are spinning, flapping their hands and tapping things. And especially you may Notice that since you, a lot of you guys have uh, some family members that are autistic, you know, if they, instead of they are playing the toy, especially the cars, um, instead of they playing like this, they just uh, flip over and they like to spin the little wheels. And they love to watch that. Isn't that correct? If you observe any of your uh, family members there. So when we design it, Usually, one of the process what we go through in interior design is case studies, which means I like to find out is there any similar projects that has been designed. So then I can learn from already existing projects. At the time, I didn't find any of the autism-related facilities it designed architecturally designed in America at the time. So I got a zero information. So, and I kind of expanding my research to other parts of the country, world, especially in European countries. There's a, quite a few um, uh, institutions in London. They did a, quite a bit of the artistic uh, institutions, research is done by some of the architects. One of the famous one is a Sunfield study, which it helped me a lot for that. And the other one that I found out was um, um, both of the Germany and Netherlands, they use Sunzulun, which is a multi-sensory therapy as a um, therapy for the uh, people with the autism. So that kind of a triggers me in Germany itself, there's about 150 um, um, kind of a multi-sensory kind of a environment in Germany by itself. So it got to have a, some sort of the uh, effect on to the uh, multi-sensory uh, therapy. So I started doing some research about the multi-sensory research environments. Uh, multi-sensory environment is a form of the, um, the therapies to improve the client's care through the use of the appropriate sensory stimulation using the light, using the color and sound, the music was sent. There's a, all, almost five different senses. They are using it as a part of the um, therapies here. Um, the, that is called the snoozulun. Snoozulun was developed about 1970s in, a, in the kind of a therapist uh, in Netherlands. While they are kind of counseling 
some autistic um, uh, children. So they developed a certain equipment which can be effective to increase their um, sensory aspects of it or let them calm with a certain sensory aspects. Depends on the, their uh, either hypo or hyper. Okay, based on study, there is a, um, about 50% um, of the autistic uh, people um, got uh, less of the stress, or 75% of the autistic uh, the client less less get uh, aggressive. And here the MSE stands for multisensory environment, by the way. And these are the few examples of the multi-sensory equipment here. So some are like a, a bubble tubes and a five optic curtains, you know, bubble mirrors, and projection stuff is a, what is it called, ball pool. And this is a weighted blanket. This blanket is a very heavy, they, one of these, uh, uh, the people, they love out of these blankets. Some of these weighted blankets, even I tried all this uh, multi-sensory equipment, I'm trying to see when therapists in Netherlands, when they develop this, what are they trying to get out of it? So I tried to experience all this equipment by myself also. Then I found out this weighted blanket gives a very similar kind of feeling when someone steps on me with the pillows on top of me. So that is a, some sort of the relationship between their behavior and some of the, these equipments here. And there's a beanbag chair here. Uh, the beanbag chair is a somewhat beanbag chair and a, this swing. Both of them give a very similar kind of effect. They give a sense of the crossing it. Somebody give a kind of a hugging you kind of feel to it. So they love that. Among all this, this is a quite a few of the examples here, but among these uh, multi-sensory equipment, uh, based on the research done, is a, this ball pool is a, probably the most favorite uh, uh, synodalian equipment among the autistic children. So um, I decided to adopt multi-sensory uh, environment to this my very first project, which is a cove. Cove is uh, uh, located in uh, uh, Paradise, California. Um, this is an uh, adaptive reuse uh, case of the project. This uh, cove used to be a church before. You know, so they bought the church building and they are converted into autism center here. So. Based on their client's requirement, which is what we call the program, programming aspects here, so we create the main hole here, uh, main hole here. Here is the main entrance is here, and here's a water fountain here. Now, one of the reasons we have a water fountain, because I need to talk very close to the microphone, I think it helps the you know, back uh, control room there. Uh, one of the reasons I put a water fountain, water fountain has a repetitive sound from the water, as you can tell. So they like that type of the sound effect also. And also, the other part is, through these water fountains, this is a big hole here, the kind of main hole here, but that divides into the larger space and the smaller space throughout the uh, hard walls there, too. And there is a, a offices here, an office, one of the main function of the office is uh, they have a window here so they can observe that uh, main activity room so make sure is any accidents are happening, uh, kind of observing the, the clients there too. And here is a, a escape room and here is a computer lab here. Computer lab is at the time they start to have a lot of the app developed through the iPad or iPhone, even in a computer touch screen. There's a lot of the apps are developed for the uh, people with the autism also. So that computer lab is for mainly for the app. So these are the, uh, so the look of the space here. And uh, I'm kind of a, all this, uh, most of the lighting solution is a, um, 
indirect lighting solutions, which is that there's the minimize the glare. Uh, and also on the floor, this is the old cork floor here. And the reason I use the cork floor was um, uh, while I'm practicing the design, I'm trying to uh, make it the space sustainable as possible. So that's one of the reasons I specified the cork here. And also cork gives a little warmth of the, the floor. So when the artistic clients, when they're touching the, the floor, it's less cold and it doesn't give a lot of the shock to it. And also, these are cork, uh, cork materials observed as some sound, so that acoustic value as well. So, and also while I was talking with the, uh, uh, the, the staff, and they, I, I asked them to what kind of activities they have, so then they do a lot of the games and uh, instructions, ask them to come go somewhere. So I create a little pilaster here, and there's a stripe of the floor. Not only the visual effects, that is a, one of the stripes they can, the teachers, they can use that as a part of the teaching facilities there. Instead of having a certain mark, they use as a floor as a, some of the teaching. And also, this is a, what is a pilaster right here. The main pilaster, I create the pilaster, not only the dividing the space, I try to give a sense of the security, make the clients feel like they are in a secure place, with a pilaster gives an illusion of they are supported by these columns. So that's one of the aspects. Um, and this, the same room, with a multi-sensory equipment, the spaces look like this. So most of the time, the space is similar to this here. Um, these are some of the, um, the bubble mirrors and the fiber optic lights and fiber optic curtains. This is, uh, uh, the, you're looking to the, the window, this is the kind of a, uh, observation room, so uh, kind of staff, they are sitting there, they're looking at the window, observing all those clients, make sure is any accident is happening there too. So if the clients see that who is in the back, they may have a little different reaction, so we cover up with uh, some fiber optic curtains, so trying to make them feel like they are by themselves rather than they are being watched. I think that nobody likes to watch, isn't that true? Um, this is the escape room. Escape room means while the clients got aggravated or break down and they needed some place to go to be calmed down or escape from the certain situation. So we name it as an escape room. And also we use the word for the pink room here. The reason is a pink room is um, while I was working on a research for this here, the time when we start to select in the color palettes for this project, I did a little research about the, how the color works for uh, individuals with autism. So I did a little keyword of the um, mental disability with the color, or some learning disability with the colors, and a psychopathic uh, client with a color effect. So I'm sorry to use the psychopathic, but I honestly, I type it that way. But I try not to use the word in a public lecture. But I'm trying to get every single keyword to relate to mental aspects of, and aspects and relationship with the colors. So that's what that is. Here, based on my research, I found out a lot of the uh, mental jail cells, and they use most of the color palettes are pink and or violet. And also the, a lot of the mental hospitals, they use the pink as a part of the therapy for um, designing of their interior environment also. Uh, so that's why uh, this, uh, the space is uh, the pink and the violet here. And a lot of the, this uh, uh, visual theme was uh, water. So we have a water bubbles, you know, here. And we have water fountains, water bubbles, and uh, quiet uh, this uh, escape room or quiet room with uh, some multi-sensory equipment also. 
Um, one of the um, uh, project was space, one of the elements that I designed in this uh, uh, the space was uh, uh, steaming uh, steaming wall uh, wall projection wall room here. So based on my observation of the uh, flipping the um, um, kind of a paper and uh, some comb, I noticed that it dissecting the all your what you see is a different kind of a segment, they love to see that. So I created an analog version, a version of the, uh, this uh, dissecting the wall here. So, you know, extruding different form of the, these uh, elements here. So this is uh, some of the diagrams here. Basically, it has only the, what, 12 different shapes, and all of them has a different extrusion, so that makes me much uh, easier to build. And when I asked this wall to estimate for the contractor, uh, they asked about $36,000 to build this wall. We have a zero money for that. So that's what I come up with. How can I make that much simpler and uh, cheaper? So I ended up developing this system. We ended up spending $1,000 to build this. Of course, it was not by the contractor. We hired one of the graduate students to build this. So he charged us all those money, but he built very quickly. So this is a part of the, the process of the development here. And of course, then uh, we used uh, all MDF as of all this material because one of the least expensive uh, the building materials we can use. One of the biggest disadvantages, the MDF is very heavy. But, so that gives a lot of the challenging to installation later on. So this is the installation process. So when we um, project some images, it breaks down like this here. So when we project some of the movies, you know, so these are the kind of a Can we get the sound? Maybe nobody's there. It was working earlier. So anyway, so without the sound, uh, you may see that probably all of you know this movie is a Finding Nemo. So especially all those visually, it breaks down the, these images. That gives a lot of the three-dimensional illusions. Oftentimes the clients, they climb up to that place they think it's actual fish is there, they're going up there, and they, it's very interactive you know, for use of this wall there. So that's why usually I call this an analog ver version of the the, st uh, the steaming wall. Okay. Almost done. Okay. So then we uh, play a lot of different kind of uh, movies here. So this is the one of the movie we played here. Anybody knows the name of this movie? You have to, please. Every lecture that I give, except the one occasions, there always the one person find out what this movie is. Huh? Who's that? Raise your hand, please. Actually, I have a little prize for you. <laughs> Seriously? This is a, one of my... Uh, favorite cookie at the airplane. I didn't eat this time, I saved this for as a present for you. So, this is a, a, the, what is that, a, a caramel wafer. It's very tasty, my favorite. So I'll give that to you. Come and see me at the end of the lecture, so. So, yeah, this is a, a movie from the Ice Age. Did you see the movie? You noticed that this Ice Age? <laughs> Okay, that, I think that you have very good art students' potential to be. Because it's, sound. it's gone, sound. it's done now. So.
So because it must be, you have a very good visual memory. So where's the little uh, scroll hanging down here? Okay, um, I think that we need to move a little fast here. And usually, uh, interior design, what we call is a post-occupancy evaluations, which means after we finish the design, we go back to the, uh, the space. Uh, after what, three or four months later, we reevaluate the uh, uh, interior space, how the space is being used here. Of course, I didn't do the post occupancy evaluation because since I'm the one who designed it, I may give a very positive result for this. So, actually, this is a uh, research is done by graduate students from University of Florida. They came to California and they did this post occupancy evaluation. So, they found out. Um, um, the widely open space here uh, work very negatively to the client. Clients feel very lost within this big space here. And also the multi-sensory environment was uh, too overwhelming for the clients when all the uh, sensory devices are on. So that's, I realized that that didn't work it out good as what I thought, so, you know. Um, some of the findings here, uh, as you, we talked about this here, the, we put some stripes here, and some clients, they got obsessed with the stripe floor, so they don't do anything all day, they are chasing the, the lines. So that uh, became a little problem for that later on. And also, the, I used the cork floor for the warmth and uh, acoustic reasons, and then I found out it's not a, a hard enough you know, kind of a tough enough to kind of um, uh, handle the uh, aggressive client's use of the furniture. They are banging it and uh, scratching and that, so it became a little too fragile for the, the client's use, way they are using the furniture. So then that's one of the problems that I found out. And the, this pink room was a, got a very good uh, 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 reception from the client. It ended up one of the uh, favorite room for all the clients uh, space was this pink room. And based on some of the articles that I read, because some of the news, uh, newspaper um, reporters, they went to the, this cove and they interviewed with uh, some of the staff people there. And the staff, they says, um, when the clients got really aggravated, got a, a breakdown, when they go to the, this pink room, after about 30 minutes later, usually they come back or come out with a big smile and a calm down. So obviously, this, uh, the pink room worked very well for the uh, um, kind of a frustrated clients here. So based on that, uh, the result, I designed another project here. That is called SOAR. SOAR is a little bit different than a, um, uh, the other project. Most of the, the client in SOAR is a very aggressive, especially very uh, challenging clients are in these facilities there. In COVE, usually like uh, each caregiver uh, handles or well, take care of the about two or three clients. In this SOAR, most of the one clients usually have two caregivers. So they are quite a bit challenging clients. So the, so the way they are using is a quite a different than um, uh, other space here. So these are some of the, um, the sketches here. And this time uh, we created the little uh, different layers of the ceiling height and some of the mostly indirect light. And one thing we found out part of the uh, uh, post-occupancy evaluation studies here, the clients love the outdoors. So these facilities are uh, right next to the AT&T truck uh, warehouse. It's all barbed wires uh, everywhere. It's a very scary environment. So there's, uh, we cannot use the outdoor at all because of the surrounding is really bad. So way we bring it to the, in, uh, the uh, nature is Bring it to the interior space of the uh, this uh, sewer. We later I'll show you the more pictures. We bring the uh, nature images in the screen in the screen, and also we planted some of the plant uh, actual plant around this area. So give a three dimensional make it look like a part of the natural environment. 
One of my design philosophy is honest to the material. Oftentimes, one the, it drives me crazy is that sometimes this podium is supposed to be like a wood here, but when I see the plastic laminate look like a wood, that's a cheating. So <laughs> that is a very important for me, honest to the material. If there's a plastic laminate, make it look like a plastic laminate, not trying to be something else or a marble, especially. <laughs> if you cannot afford to marble, don't use it. <laughs> Uh, that's one of my design philosophies. Of course, I want to put actual plant, not plastic. So originally, I plant. I decide to. I specify as an actual plant, and even we have a, a plant program has a, some kind of taking care of the uh, activities of plants there. Then I found out a certain clients who used to come to this uh, store that clients eat the plant. So I didn't have option to not to use the plastic plant this time. So, <laughs> so that's uh, one of the um, aspects I found that some of the challenges are there here. Um, so these are the, some of the uh, design after uh, finish that here. So this is the main area here, and this is uh, one of the uh, uh, storage area. So we use uh, some of the colored boxes. Each client has a different color, so they can use more of the uh, easy identifi identification of the, their own belongings there. And this is uh, some classrooms, and this is the, you know, the some of the activity space here. The main difference in this design is all the, actually we can talk some more later here. Um, so that's the design here. Um, so um, one of the biggest complaint was uh, there's a six clients, there's a 12 caregivers, one for two caregivers. So almost 20 people in the space. They, we got a lot of the complaints about space is too small for this client. We didn't thought about that number of the caregiver part. Mostly we focus on to the client's number. So that was the part of my mistake, actually. You know. So uh, these are some of the reactions from the, uh, the caregivers. And one of the difficulties about the designing for, uh, especially the post-occupancy evaluation of the uh, space of the, for the autism here, is because we cannot ask directly to the client or users, how do they like it, how do you feel? So a lot of the information is collected through the caregivers. So basically the third person's opinion. So it may not be the 100% accurate. So. Um, but and the, some of the, the comments from the caregivers was uh, um, the space is not that big, but um, the flow is a very easy to flow here. Oops. Yeah, that's the one here. So that's the easy access of that one here, easy uh, traffic flow here. So while the older space is uh, divided as a compartmentalized here, so that gives a uh, less distractive. So each individual can have uh, its own space here. So it worked out quite well for the space layout. And the previous uh, the core project, we kind of bombarded with a lot of the multi-sensory equipment after the, some post-occupancy evaluations. And this one, we got much less of the multi-sensory equipments here um, compared to that. And uh, acoustically, and because of multi-layers, all those installations, very well done. So we got a very good uh, reaction from the clients about the acoustic values. And a lot of times, this space is a uh, a lot of the screaming and yelling and the crying is happening in this room, but next door, there's no complaint about what's going on inside of this one here. So that means the acoustic value was really well done here. And the lighting, um, about the, um, the indirect lighting solutions. Also, when I specify the light, 
most of the lighting was uh, I chose the color temperature wise uh, pretty much like a uh, 3000 Kelvin level of, I'm sorry, it's a little too technical term for that. So which means a uh, warm light use that is that gives a uh, very helpful for relaxing the client. And also this is a, a picture. Uh, we printed this uh, uh, environment uh, called view of the mountains in the screen. In the back, there's LED lights is changing the colors, you know, so it gives a little depth of the space, and that gives an outdoor effect here, and these are the fake plant. But it looks, no one knows, I know. And also the, um, uh, especially, uh, we pay a lot of attention to the material specifications, especially the non-toxic materials and a VOC-free paint, and also mostly the neutral colors. You know. So the uh, cut piles and the short piles in a multi-sensory room here. And especially this time, we changed the linoleum floor. We tested many different kinds of materials here. Uh, then linoleum floor, it shows a very well uh, survival from the rough use usage of the furniture. And also for the safety reasons, we use a plex glass, so instead of a, the uh, regular glass there. And this uh, compartmentalized the space here, it works out very good to not to distracting. And the visual access wise here, and each room has a little windows here, small windows like here, so we can observe the client very kind of a make sure they are doing good here. And one of the mistake that we made it here in a kitchen, we made you know, a big door here with the, uh, the glass here. Then we found a program. Whenever they're hungry, they come and look at the, uh, you can see that the people came in all over the uh, window and they want to see what's menu today, so. And this is the, uh, uh, one of the instances, we didn't have this bench before, but this wall was um, right there. Here is a widely open space right there. Each time, we got a lot of the clients, they go there, punch the wall here, the oval is a big horse into that one here. So then I decided to, instead of doing something, I put a little park bench there so after we park bench, it never happens. So we put some obstacles in front of the certain walls to kind of a, for the safety reasons there. It worked out very well. Also, it doesn't look that kind of harsh. Also, the park bench looks very well together with uh, the plants. So. so these are some of the design recommendations. I'm, going a little faster because I time is uh, running here. Um, actually, the uh, design recommendations pretty much uh, I already mentioned to during the lecture here. Um, incorporating uh, the space, a mix of the, some of the open and a closed space, and in having a little small or large space, they give a little interest to the space there. And also the make the space a little interesting to move around. So, you know, kind of a, when they are bored or doing nothing and they start to causing a trouble, so make the space a little something they can discover all the time, okay? Um, create a sense of the clarity and order of the space is very important. Um, create a smooth transition between the space to space, you know, for the activities here. Um, uh, incorporate the appropriate sensory equipment to uh, soothe and uh, stimulate the sense of the um, um, individuals with the clients. And having an escape room will be very important to have for the classroom here. So, okay, as a conclusions, as you can see here, first project. I'm very happy about it, but I found out it didn't work out that well. So continuation of the research, which is the post-occupancy evaluations, improves the quality of the space on and on. So that is, I believe, is a professional interior designer's role, not 
just make the space beautiful. As you can tell here, all those design um, visual clarities, warmth of the light, acoustics, and if you think about it, all of the aspects, that is uh, universal design. So designing a space for autism is not something different. Who is not gonna like that kind of a pleasant environment? Everybody likes it, including autistic person. So I found out art, uh, designing for autism is not something special. That's a good for everybody. It's a, well, interior designers, what we call it a universal design. And one thing, for, through this project, uh, this project uh, changed my life. Otherwise, I'd never be here. Um, as an interior designer, one thing it little bothered me at an early stage was, um, of course, you know, designing beautiful space, uh, designing a, a beautiful interior space for the uh, people with the very well off, which is a big part of that too, our interior design. So one thing, one aspect it kind of bothered me was, whether well, interior design is only for the uh, uh, affluent societies where we are designing for. So, you know, especially this kind of artistic client, and probably they never can uh, enjoy or affordable to design by some professional designers. So kind of through this uh, design exercise, it, that gives me a lot of the um, pride or confidence as an as a interior designer, we can do something make a difference or make the society, we can change the society. So that gives me a lot of the, uh, I don't know, I think uh, I very, I'm very proud to be an interior designer after this project. I feel like I'm doing something. So, so that's what is basically I'm talking about, social responsibilities here. So um, any questions? Yes. Yes. Yeah, actually, the, the, the other color is a violet, and uh, uh, instead of making all space a pink, I'm trying to give a, some depth of the space, so I use uh, two different color, one is a pink, one is a violet. Both of them are very effective for um, metal. Uh, Yeah, usually the most of the time the clients they stay there is uh, between the 20 to 30 minutes. So we found out when clients are there about 30 minutes or less, usually they come down and then they come out. So even the multi-sensory equipment, the surgical equipment, what the, you know, the Dutch uh, scientists recommend is that 30 minutes is a magic number for that therapy also. So we are just putting there a few hours. Yeah. Yes. So with the five years that you got from the, the, the code and store research, are you going to uh, use those findings to improve these programs? Yes. Um, Actually, the, I'm testing it right now here. In the core space, it was about 10 years ago, that father was about 10 years ago. It's about time to uh, crack up here. This time, and I think this is a bottle here from the Boy Scout. We, took a, we went there with the one of our paint faculty and they took them to the uh, Boy Scout about the how to paint. So we changed the color palette right now. So we are testing it. 
When we change the color palette, whether there be any uh, in fact on to this a new color palette. So we are working. Only we are working on to find the better information for that. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, I kind of, one of the uh, biggest uh, changes is I'm trying to listen more way the clients need. And uh, more than just a general perception of the how the space is looking and the clients ask for it, I'm trying to do some little more in-depth research about it and we'll find out what do they need. So, you know, Especially, especially when you design some normal project, we ended up providing a lot of things like tiles and looking for. So that part is a little, but one of the biggest difference between the, some of the residential design or other projects, which is the artistic project is different, is a lot of the projects, clients, this is not there. Of course, there's a lot of room to improve it. But same thing for this project, clients want they know what they want. They want a copy. But they didn't have any copy. By the way, in a code, there's no zero copy. Even they ask me to copy, there's no copy. 